The Woman on the Pedestal. I'm pretty near the end of Pamela, the novel about the heroine whose virtue gets rewarded. How does she manage to hold on to her treasure? It really is, since once fallen, she'll be pregnant and nobody in the whole 18th century will offer her shelter. By shelter, I don't just mean social protection. I mean a place to come in from the rain. For hundreds of pages, she flees one threat after another and hats off to her. Although a girl without social status, Pamela is never confused by the wiles, manipulative insinuations, threats, insults, and near violence of her fine gentleman pursuer. With preternatural insight, she sees how he risks his own soul every time he menaces her innocence. For his sake, as well as her own, she wants to reform him, and her resistance has such a stunning effect on his villainous intentions that he experiences a complete turnaround. He comes to share her high ideals, to love her devotedly, and ultimately they marry. Thus, he raises her socially while she lifts him up spiritually. If you can read about this without a little sigh, you're more liberated than I am. What I find striking is that Pamela never loses her presence of mind. In the martial arts of this unequal struggle, she never makes a self-defeating move, since in the course of their combat, she comes to be enamored of him, she wins on every front. Of course, this virtuous woman was penned by a man. A different book arrived via FedEx today. Kierkegaard's Muse, The Mystery of Regina Olson, the girl whom the philosopher Søren Kierkegaard jilted and of whom he famously said, I shall take her, meaning her image, with me into history. He meant take her image into the history books, not herself into real history. Kierkegaard is one of the important and original philosophers, a herald and forerunner of what a century later would be called existentialism. He is not just studied in classrooms. He really is read by philosophers, theologians, and seekers who gain insights from him about how to relate to God and how to achieve personal authenticity. And yet, for Kierkegaard, unethically breaking it off with his fiancée, made everything possible in his work, even as he continued to love and idealize her. Everyone who knows Kierkegaard knows about Regina. Rightly or wrongly, Kierkegaard felt that he could not make her the right kind of flesh-and-blood husband. Like many philosophy students, I've read with fascination Kierkegaard's version of what happened between him and Regina when he vowed to leave the real girl behind but take her memory with him into history. But what was it for her? It was, so far as I can tell, her utter undoing Though she did manage to get engaged to another man, her personal papers, reviewed in this new biography, 
reveal that she never detached her mind from the man who had loved and jilted her, though she survived him by 50 years. The life of a woman whom a man hasn't scrupled to freeze into his inspiration when he was unprepared to live their joint story together, what is it? What can it be? A frozen life, one that dare not step forward enough to outlive the moment when she became his ideal. Are these illustrative cases, the fictional Pamela's and the historical Regina's, dated? Are they figures of yesterday or the day before yesterday? Maybe, but offhand I can think of a number of women, some of them in the forefront of the feminist movement, who became the better angels of men who betrayed or disappointed them profoundly. In public, many feminists repudiate the whole structure, the pedestal, and the woman trying to stand on it. I don't. When invited by another woman to tarnish your image because idealizations are so yesterday, look around first to see if there's anything she might want for which you'd become less eligible if your image were tarnished. Tread carefully. The world of women is a subtle world. Beware of the big simplifications. What's the middle way between the extremes? Take your beloved with you into history.